Welcome to 8 Million, a podcast series that looks at the 8 million metric tons of plastic entering our oceans every year and the role China is playing to address this global challenge. 8 Million is produced by Sustainable Asia and its partners China Dialogue and Aya Recording Studio. Previously on 8 Million. In 2015, China bought 50 million metric tons of solid waste. We generate more garbage than any other country. So why do we still import waste from abroad to fuel our recycling industry? Developed countries cannot solve their own environmental and resource problems through export. Hi, this is Marcy Trent Long. I've lived in Hong Kong for the past 20 years and watched the increasing amount of disposable plastic really alter the fabric of our oceans and beaches here. As someone who sails and is an avid open water swimmer, plastic waste has really changed the way I look at quality of life here. And as more of my friends here in Asia are starting to use the ocean as their playground, they too are seeing plastic as an unpleasant an unnecessary result of our convenience-driven lifestyle. The goal of this podcast series is to reveal the inner workings of plastic waste management in China so that I can make some sense of the impact that China is having on ocean plastic. In this episode, I want to look at recycling. So first, let's talk to Doug Woodring, an environmental entrepreneur and co-founder of Ocean Recovery Alliance. Based here in Hong Kong, Doug started working with the United Nations years ago to try to solve the problem of ocean plastic, and in the process has become an expert on the global recycling market. Uh, The challenge is that the waste systems of today globally mostly are not prepared to handle all of the myriad of types of plastic that are now in the waste stream. 30 years ago, they could handle paper and metal and glass and organics in an easier way. Now you mix it with plastic, it becomes much, much harder to deal with these very lightweight, uh, permanent type, flexible materials. And there are just too many varieties of plastic. There's 40,000 types. 40,000, that's only the number today. Uh, That's not including all the nanotechnologies and nanomaterials that are coming our way. Uh, But 40,000 lives in seven families. So there's, if you see on the bottom of the materials, there's often one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And those categories can more or less be recycled in their own uh, genres, if you will, uh, flavors or families um, together, if you can get them together. The problem is you can't put them all together usually unless you have a new technology that does mix plastic uh, recycling. Okay, so you can't recycle all plastic together. And many products use three or four kinds of plastic in one package. But how do we get to 40,000 different types of plastic? So how did we get there? Partly we got there through the effort to reduce climate change. This is an unintended consequence because everyone wants to lightweight. Lightweight this, lightweight that, get transportation costs less. And by doing that, the only material you can go straight into is plastic. By using plastic in cars and planes, They become lighter and use less fuel. But while lighter plastics are helping the environment in one way, they make recycling a hassle and often just not worth the effort. Because plastic recyclers get paid per ton of material. Imagine plastic bottles, unless you shred them or compress them in high pressure, they are just a big mass of air wrapped in plastic. And so when you have 40,000 bottles, which is one ton, It would more than fill this room in space, but it's only one ton of material. If you have one ton of uh, metal or wood right here, it would be one cubic meter or something like that. So we have to also think about this challenge of space with a very lightweight material. And uh, that's what's causing the low recycling rates generally. 
So recyclers are struggling with an increasing variety of plastics for which they need to find resale markets. And on top of that, plastics are also becoming increasingly light, giving them more work for less money. It's no wonder the developed world was outsourcing this thankless job to China. So how can we make recycling more efficient? Hong Kong recycler Philip Lee talked to me about this. He runs a social enterprise collecting recyclable waste in the city, but his business has taken a hard hit with China's new ban. He still believes recycling is the way to go, but some things will need to change. For a start, the public will need to be educated more on how to recycle plastic. Because the landscape is always changing, there's always materials that you can recycle in this moment in time, but in the next moment in time, you can recycle it. And then as a recycler, you know, we might have to inform them about these changes. And that's part of the education process and the feedback process that, that is so valuable. Um, but also in terms of, you know, the fundamentals of knowing what type of plastics can be recycled or can't be recycled. So there's these basic ideas that people need to understand first before, you know, we can make the system efficient. And this has to be taught when you're young. It has to be a habit. Food remains in the recycling bin, for instance, is one of the things that gives industry a headache. The problem with recycling plastic is the cost and the sorting and the cleaning. So if you get it in the first mile clean from your house, there's much more chance that the, either the unregulated race pickers or the very advanced shredders and entrepreneurs are going to get that material and make use of it. That's a global change that could happen, I think, very easily with two quick ideas, wet and dry. If you sort things by just making two decisions, wet and dry, you will then be able to take all of the material, plastic, paper, metal, glass, as dry because it's not covered with grease and food waste. And as Philip told me, the recycler then just needs to crush and shred it before it can be recycled. As long as separating wet and dry waste remains the job of the recycling industry, it will be more profitable to ship the waste off to a developing country. But consumers are not the only ones who need to change. Then you have uh, the marketing guys and the design guys who want differentiation. I want my bottle to be green and mine to be blue and mine to be yellow and mine to be red and the size is a little bit different and then you mix the materials and that's where you get into this disaster zone of recycling. So there's no standardization uh, laws on material use and there's not enough design thought put into the afterlife of that product and how to take it apart. So we build these things, but we don't think about how to get them apart again and then get the different material types into those streams of seven families. If you look at a bottle that consists of around three types of plastic, the lid, the bottle, and the uh, labeling. So that's what makes it, you know, so difficult to recycle because in one product, there's different types of plastics. A shampoo bottle has the metal spring for the uh, lid, and then there is the tube, and then there is the bottle. So there's at least three components there. So in Hong Kong, some people actually recycle it by breaking it down manually, taking the lid off, taking off the metal screws, and then spring, and then that spring is recycled separately. The uh, tube going down to the liquid is re recycled separately, and then the bottle themselves. So if you design a product that just use one type of plastic or one type of material, then that makes it really simple. This is called designing for recyclability, and it's a hot topic in the world of plastics. Philip mentioned redesigning plastic water bottles so that they're all made of one type of plastic. Another way to rethink our use of plastic is to just limit the material to long-term products. Strong, durable plastic has a higher value to recyclers and is much less likely to end up in a dump or in the ocean. I spoke about this with Michelle Zhou. She lives in Shanghai where she runs the polycarbonate business unit of the plastics giant Covestro. The polycarbonate is uh, actually different to the short-lived and single-use plastic like plastic bags or straw or others. Our plastics are high-end engineering plastics that use for much more higher end and also long-lasting application. 
Think, for instance, of the big plastic bottles you see in office water cooler. If you are in China, or if you have been in Indonesia, for example, you know people are in need of a clean water, and they use big water bottle. And this water bottle are mostly made of a polycarbonate, and we we recycle this polycarbonate, right? And we we take them back, and we make them to your the mobile phone housing or your laptop housing, or sometimes even in your LED light. And there's a lot of enthusiasm for this kind of thinking, including in China. So our efforts actually has been really paying off. I think in the last two three years, our recycle I would say sales. I mean the recycling product has been more than triple、uh, on a single year basis. Because of course starting point is quite low, but we are we are really trying to do even more,、uh, you know, going forward. Two years ago, Doug took the business forum Plasticity, which he founded, to Shanghai, and was surprised at the keen interest for recyclable design there. When I've spoken in China on this topic before, I found people really weren't aware of it because it wasn't something I was talked about in China. There's many other issues and topics, and not really this one. So when I talked at a design fashion event one time to a full house. People were seemed in awe, but they also then were very eager to solve the problem, which I found a more eagerness than some countries in the West, which are a bit maybe numb to some of this discussion. So that's why we said we need to go to China. This was two years ago because they are ready and they want to know how to solve some of these things, but they haven't been given information or the ideas. And more companies across China are taking on the challenge. The Chinese government is changing up the country's waste management infrastructure and mandating 46 cities to reach a 35 percent recycling rate by 2020. Given the complicated nature of recycling and heavy investment required, it's unsure how these cities will meet that objective. So new ways to cope with plastic waste are being tried and tested, against the wishes of grassroots activists. But with demonstrable success, the Chinese are building more waste energy plants than the rest of the world together. When I asked Doug about this billion-dollar industry of burning trash, his reply surprised me. It's very important. It's it's absolutely necessary if we really want to solve the problem of the of the waste getting into our waters. Join me next time as we explore the world of waste energy. This podcast was brought to you by Sustainable Asia. Eight Million was produced by me, Marcy Trent Long, and the multi-talented Sam Beckemans. We could not have pulled this podcast series together without our amazing audio engineers, Annabeth and Karsten Martins of Aya Recording Studio. Our logo and social media outreach was by Kinsey Long, and special thanks to our voiceover Kian Lee, audio assistant Daniel Sun. And our wonderful partners at China Dialogue, Isabel Hilton, who helped us formulate the idea for the project, Charlotte Middlehurst and Christopher Davy for their editing skills, and Huang Lushan for stepping in with interviews and translation. Share this podcast with your friends and colleagues. Education and collaboration are our best path for creating a sustainable Asia. Thank you.